I'm with uh, David Eves. David Eves is a senior lecturer at the Harvard School of Government and uh, an expert in digital transformation. And we're very happy to have you here, David. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Welcome. Um, let me start from the general to the particular. Uh, the, uh, uh, the conversation today is about digital transformation and government. Um, it, you see digital transformation everywhere in every industry. Uh, the idea or the perception is that that transformation is not as quick and as smooth in government. Is that a good perception or is it a bad perception? I think it's probably, uh, I think it's fair, but not quite as fair as it could be. Um, there's a lot of industries and a lot of companies that have really struggled with the transition to the digital economy and thinking of themselves as a digital organization. One of the one of the things that makes it hard to make that comparison is that the companies that fail to make that transition often go bankrupt or disappear or get acquired. And so they kind of disappear from the data pool. So when you're looking at the companies that have made the transition versus the governments and how they're performing, often what you end up doing is you're looking at a group of companies that have made the transition sex successfully or at least are still around. And all the ones that have disappeared aren't actually part of that comparison pool. So. It's, I actually think the private sector struggled with this as well. It's just that the data disappears. The big difference is, is we basically can't afford to have public sector organizations disappear. So they, have, they lag, but the consequences of that lag are very significant. In the private sector, the capital gets redeployed, um, the, kind of the knowledge gets redeployed, the markets get served in new ways. In the public sector, that doesn't happen, and so the consequences are much more serious. So you always have the government. Yeah, one hopes one always has the government. Okay. So you have governments that are, are digitally transformed, yep. and those are not digitally transformed. Yeah, I would say it would be hard to, you know, there are some common examples like Estonia, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of governments that one would say have digitally transformed. I think there's a lot of governments that are at various stages of a journey. So how, how do you see, I mean, what's the difference between Estonia and one that did, has not and gone through the digital transformation. So I think the, the misconception is that what makes Estonia different from other countries is that they've built all this digital infrastructure mm -hmm. um, and that they have all these services online and you know, kind of most famously they have the, the e-citizenship. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I think that's important, but actually what the Estonians have, have really done is two things that are much, much more important. One is they've really figured out what is the kind of legislative and policy infrastructure that one needs to have in place in order to engage in that digital transformation and then to exist in that world. So they really thought through a lot, not everything, but around the kind of the cybersecurity piece, the privacy piece, um, how the organizations within government are gonna to work together. Those pieces are much more thought through and that foundation has been laid more thoroughly in Estonia than you see in lots of other countries. So, um, and, then the, and then on top of that, they have begun to wrestle with what are the kind of HR implications of living in that world? Who needs to be trained in what ways? How do, what, is the, what does a public servant look like? There's kind of a, there's a much deeper culture and kind of organizational behavior piece to this, of which then the technology also becomes a, a factor. But that's really kind of the third layer that sits on top of those, those first two. Super clear, super clear. Now, some people would tell you, well, Estonia is a small country. Yeah. Homogeneous. Yes. Okay. And sometimes, especially in our country Latin America, of Latin America and the Caribbean, countries are large and yep. heterogeneous. Yes. So are we talking about something that we can actually compare? No, I think this is a great point. I think there are real limits to what you can compare Estonia to. And certainly the path that they took to get to where they got to, in my mind, is not highly replicable by most countries. There's probably some out there, but by most countries. So I'm Canadian, mm -hmm. very, very large company, smaller population than some mm -hmm. of the Latin American countries, but, um, but, but very diverse. I'm not at all convinced that Estonia offers uh, a path for how we get from A to B, particularly kind of like, oh, you do step one, then step two, then step three, then step four. Uh, I think there's gonna be, each country's gonna have to figure out its own way of getting there. Let me ask you this. Uh, if you move from the general idea of government yep. to the, uh, what we call here the social sectors, which are essentially education, health, social protection, and employment, uh, we see a lot of challenges there. Um, we're going to talk today about the health sector 
but certainly we see it for every uh, service out there that the government is providing. Why is it so difficult to transform these sectors? Well, one, I think a lot of these sectors have very strong norms and culture about how the professions that work within them operate. So this is the, the, the corporate organization you're talking about. No, I mean actually more structured. broadly, like teachers or doctors. Okay. I mean there are there are large like, these are large workforces mm -hmm. that have been trained in a certain way, mm -hmm. and and everything from the particular skills that they have to even how they perceive their role and how they perceive what value they bring and how they want to be perceived within society or within the school. Those things are are very. Those are strong norms that exist in those organizations. And um, digital transformation, you're asking them not just to learn how to use a laptop or a tool differently, you're asking them to often rethink a lot of how they deliver the services, the public benefits they mm -hmm. deliver, but also about how they think of their role, the skills that they have. And you can't just kind of flick a switch and move a population that thinks one way from doing things to another way. So our only hope is to wait for the next generation to no, come along? No, I don't think that that is the answer either because um, one is, uh, you know, Jim, Jim Collins in Good to Great mm -hmm. has this great, it's a fantastic book, fantastic. Um, but he talks a lot about um, people who don't adhere to a culture being ejected by that culture. So he says, you know, if you try to bring someone into a mm -hmm. company and they don't kind of conform to the culture of that company, they just kind of get rejected. I, I think one of the things that makes these, these communities challenging is even when they want to change, doing the change is hard and it, and it causes a rethink. And a lot of people, even those who want to do that, large part of the culture may not want to. And so they kind of even if they want to make the change, it's hard not to reject. And so it's not clear to me that, you know, having a new generation come in is just magically solves the problem. They're still, st they're still inside uh, a set of culture, but also networks and infrastructure that push them to behaving a certain way. So if you go now to the health sector, yeah. uh, is that sector different than others in terms of what digital transformation means? I mean, you talk about corporate organization, and I think that you, you can compare the education and the health sector. But there's issues of introduction of technology, of organization in general, what kind of uh, technical capacities you have that are different in the health sector. But tell me what, what's it's your It's a good idea. question. I mean, one thing that I think does make a challenge is, you know, I mentioned earlier this notion of um, a sense of who doctors and nurses are, kind of mm -hmm. that sense of mm -hmm. professional. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're almost, I think teachers have a very high degree of that. Lawyers and doctors may be higher still, like that there's a tr like there's a professional organization that, that says a lot about who we are as a people, who we are and what we do, and <coughs> figuring out ways to, to move, the problem is it's not an organization, but to move a group of people is not simple. And so it could be that the, the that healthcare will be harder because of the community involved. Not that they don't want to change, not that they're bad people, it's, it's that, you know, they, there are a bunch of, there are a set of practices, rules, and norms that have served them very, very well. And for very good reasons, they may be very reluctant to move off of those into something that's less known so to them. So that's risk aversion? Sorry? Risk aversion? I, you risk aversion, but, but not in a healthy one. Again, uh -huh. these are rules that have, and, and norms and cultures that have served them very well. So getting them to think differently or behave differently could be quite challenging. Let me turn it around. Uh, one of my favorite books is The Patient Will See You Now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, which I love the title. Uh, so it's at the future in the digital transformation era for the health si uh, system. The idea that the patient will have, you know, control and that will take, uh, you know, uh, at the same time personalization and a change in the way patients are served. Is that the future? Um, I... I don't see much of that future so far. Okay. You know, if, if you, it's interesting, actually. In you were some, very careful there, so yeah. I want to be sure that. Uh, you know, I, it's just. Is that coming I, or it's not coming fast I, enough? I don't, I don't see it coming quickly. Okay. For two reasons. One is the sheer shortage of doctors globally would suggest a pure supply and demand perspective yeah, yeah. that I don't think patients are going to have that power. Uh, you know, even in America, where there are more doctors often than many mm -hmm. other places, it's not like patients are, you know, getting unlimited time with their doctors unless they have an, significant funds of, sums of money. So, I, from just a pure supply and demand perspective, it's hard to see that. Um, 
it's, it's interesting, when I think about doctors, in some ways I feel doctors may feel frustrated. I feel like, you know, now patients push back way mm -hmm. more. So Correct. there's there's definitely been a big culture shift among patients who are much less deferential, much more likely to question a doctor, get a second opinion. And so I, sometimes I worry that doctors feel like their position in society, not their position within their office, but their position with society has been diminished because people are much more questioning them. To be a doctor is still hugely valid, mm -hmm. valued, but it's not the same pillar of the community and that might have been 50 years ago. And uh, and, and patients are pushing back, back much more. And so you, but, but at the same time, the doctors are still incredible, like they're still rare enough to be hugely valued. Mm -hmm. So in some ways we have kind of the worst of both worlds. I think doctors are definitely feeling um, like society is moving around them and I'm not sure they're happy about all the consequences of that. They're not happy that people are doing Google searches and coming and questioning them and so nonstop. And they don't have the time to spend with the patients that these patients want. And nor do I think they feel necessarily the respect that they may feel like their predecessors had. So in some ways we might be already in a little bit of a culture crisis, but I don't think this applies there. Where I think, if you're gonna ask me where, why I think this transition in part will be challenging, I remember many years ago doing a workshop with a group of doctors and, and we played this game where you line up along a line where you talk about you know, whether you agree or disagree with a statement. Um, so one side's yes, one side's no. And someone asked the question, can a nurse with a computer replace a doctor? Good question. And all these doctors stood way over on the no side of the camp, except for one doctor who stood halfway between kind of maybe and yes. And then you interview them, you ask them, why are they standing where they're standing? And all these doctors are like, no, you know, the knowledge is too great. And this one doctor says, listen, I don't know if we can make the answer to this question yes, but if we don't make it yes, we're never going to solve the global health crisis because we can't train enough doctors in the next 20 or 30 or 50 years. Now let me push you back a yeah. little bit more. So a nurse with a computer. Yeah. What about taking out the nurse? Well, having only the computer. So the reason I brought up this story about the yeah. spectrum is I think it, it shines a light on how doctors see their mm -hmm. value mm -hmm. and also how they're, they're tied to roles and values that they, and the values they deliver within society that can be hard for them to think differently about what that value would be. And, and so when I think about digital transformation, it's not so much of getting a laptop or a iPad in someone's hand, it's getting them to think fundamentally and differently about the role they have and the value they deliver to both patients and society. I was, I was going for uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. And, and you know, the anecdotal evidence that we have so far, that in some cases, yes, you know, computers are more accurate uh, especially at diagnosis, diagnostics yeah. than, than uh, anything else. But, you know, in some cases, that's, that's at, at least the anecdotal evidence that we have. Uh, and that's what I wonder, you know, artificial intelligence and what the industry does and how it's going to be transformed. What's your point, what's your position there? So my sense is, uh, I think there is some evidence to suggest that certain types of roles will be more effective with AI than potentially with doctors. Right now those are relatively narrow. Will they become broader? I think is too soon. Here's what I think we do know. One is, I think it's not clear how patients are gonna to respond to that. Mm -hmm. So um, patients, are they gonna be happy having a robot telling them what their diagnosis is or are they gonna to wanna to have a human do it even if the human is less perfect? <laughs> so it's not just doctors that need to change, it's also the general populace that needs to change. And then uh, the other thing I think we do know is um, doctors plus AI are definitely gonna be better than doctors on their own. Yep. So what are we doing to help accelerate that? And then, then figure out where are the places where maybe just AI on its own are. But I would wanna be focusing on where doctors plus AI because I, all I know is that in the future, we're not getting rid of doctors. We're gonna have doctors in some capacity, so we better get, we better figure out the culture of doctors plus AI and getting them really comfortable with that and not start with AI minus the doctor because then you're gonna create a lot of resistance um, to that transition. But that's a challenge for doctors, of course. Yes. Because what I read there essentially is that what it used to be called in English uh, bedside manners. Yes. They have to change. That is to say, you know, if you have a machine on your, on your side making the diagnostic, uh, you need to be able to more, be more empathic and more close yep. to the patient, you know, a different role, so to speak. Uh, do you think that's the case? 
Um, so possibly, uh, I can imagine worlds in which um, there is a person who sits between you and the doctor and who is kind of the, <laughs> the empathy <laughs> creator, since we maybe the doctor is too busy. It could be the doctors are too busy. Like, it may be they're rare enough that they have to allocate themselves to so many patients. They don't have the, uh, the time or the capacity to be the empathetic person and that we then actually create like a, a form of intermediary between patients and doctors who are delivering the news and taking the questions. Not a perfect so a world, career of the future. but that's a possible career. Yeah. And maybe that person's interacting sometimes with a doctor and sometimes with the AI, but there's always a human in between the two of you. And I don't think that this is a, a new skill that's being brought on by AI. I remember one of my favorite studies showed um, doctors with poor bedside manner got sued more than doctors with good bedside manner, ir irrespective of the quality of, of the care. Quality of care. So if you were a bad doctor, but you were had good bedside manner, patients didn't want to sue you because they're like, oh, I like my doctor. They, you know, whereas effective doctors who were really brisk, you know, they would get sued even though they had made the right call. So I know the insurance companies are definitely interested in encouraging better bedside manner, but this is a challenge that I think we've been facing for a while already. Right, David. Uh, we have one more minute, so yeah. I'm gonna take full advantage of your time. So we're talking about healthcare, Latin America, and digital transformation. So if you were to talk to the average uh, government official in the healthcare sector uh, and uh, to advise them to push digital transformation, what are the three points that you would uh, like them to remember most? Yes, yeah, so I think the, the big mistake would be to invest in some large piece of software or system as a solution as a solution be like yeah we're going to build this you know we're going to spend 100 million dollars we're going to build some big solution it's going to work for forever and there's a lot of evidence that suggests that those types of approaches are not particularly productive um i so that'd be my first is don't don't do that don't go. um instead i would want to be thinking about what is the kind of thinking about kind of a digital infrastructure what's the digital infrastructure that you want to guide the creation of the healthcare system in particular thinking about what are the data protocols and the data standards mm -hmm. that you want to have everybody adhere to um, i think there's too much permission is given to the the providers of kind of information systems in the healthcare space to kind of set their own protocols and then you kind of get vendor lock-in instead say no this is the protocol that we're going to use this is the data standard we're going to use and try to map those out even starting with something small and then over time allowing to scale out and then allowing an ecosystem to grow on top of those standards strikes me as a much more important approach um, so those would be two and then the third is um, really uh, don't s starting small and iterating your way so really figuring out what's the most important health crisis or health problem or health challenge in your country or in your community and trying to think of ways that you can try to tackle that problem, but always with an eye to scale. So can you solve relatively narrow problems, but scaling up, but in a way that allows you to kind of scale across problems or kind of scale across sectors. So you're delivering value quickly, but you're setting the foundation to do bigger things. Great. David, we are very grateful for your time and for the conversation. We learn a lot, so that's, that's a great opportunity for us. Thank you very much for Thank being here. Thank you so much for having me. Take care.